silver sub $20 with inflation running 8% sucks. Yeah, absolutely. And for anyone who's been following precious metals for a period of time knows that interest rates are the, really the main driver of uh, precious metals prices and specifically real rates. But what I was going to show you guys here is a chart of the nominal yield on the 10-year treasury going back to 1980. And that was back when yields peaked up near 18%. I'm going to pull that chart up right now. And what's interesting about this chart is a, a couple of things, really. Let me make this a monthly view is that we are breaking out above a four decade downtrend line in nominal yields. So I've been saying for a while, I really think the bond bull market that's lasted four decades ended in March of 2020, when the nominal yield on the 10 year dropped to like 0.3%, 0.4%, which is ridiculous. But the pace that we've interest rates have risen is really unprecedented. And we're now extremely overbought. You can see this monthly RSI. It's the most overbought it's been in four decades as, you know, we're just breaking above resistance. So nothing goes in a straight line. I'm looking for a pullback in nominal yields. In other words, I think most of the Fed rate hike rhetoric is already priced in. That doesn't mean they can't raise rates more. I think they're mm -hmm. probably going to. But um, I think that most of that is already priced in. And I'm looking for a pullback in nominal yields which would sh should at least give a reprieve to the precious metal sector and you know commodities as a whole. But really, it's it's those real uh, yields that matter most. And with inflation, you know, still up over eight percent, you know, those are still negative. Well, so the the Fed, what they're what what they're what they're moving higher so dramatically is the is their Fed funds rate is the, the right. shortest short term number, and everything else like this, the ten year sort of moves with it generally, but sort of at a, it, with a mind of its own based on projections and trends and, but everything's keyed off the 10 year, right? All yeah. the, all the, all the third, you know, the mortgages are keyed off the 10 year. Mm -hmm. A lot of bank lending is keyed off the 10 year because uh, that's the big daddy that sort of drives the whole economy. Where's your daddy? Um, and it does have a bit of its mind of a mind of its own. The Fed doesn't have as much control over the 10 year as they do with the short term rates. But uh, what does that sort of indicate to you? The Fed's already raised dramatically. A lot of people are speculating this 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 rate increase that just happened uh, last Wednesday, uh, the other day, uh, might be the last one um, be, be before they have to pause. I mean, a lot of people are thinking the economy is in the process of breaking right now. Maybe we get another rate increase, but we... A lot of people, we're, we're near the end of this rate hiking cycle. I mean, they're not going to take rates up to ten percent, yeah. right? You're not. They're not going to break it. They're not. They can't. They're not. They, they're not going <laughs> to. They're not a Paul Volcker here, right? Yeah. And there's there's a four letter word for why they can't do that, and that's math. M A T H. And like yeah. we were just talking before the show, with a thirty trillion dollar national debt, every one percent rise in interest rates adds three hundred billion dollars to the interest expense every year. When we take right. in roughly four trillion, or excuse me, roughly three trillion. In, federal tax receipts. So if you go to, t let's say you went to 10% on a $30 trillion national debt, that's 3 trillion of interest payments, which would consume nearly all of the federal tax receipts. Yeah. No money for military, no money for pensions, social security, Medicare. That's crazy. So uh, this is where all this is headed. And just understanding that simple math, mm -hmm. really, I mean, I'm not trying to sugarcoat it here. Silver sub $20 with inflation running 8% sucks. Um, I didn't foresee sub $20 silver. I, I was wrong. But I sleep well at night because... I know the math and I know where this is headed and problems have solutions, predicaments have managed outcomes and there's no solution to this problem. They're, they can just dance around and manage the outcome and that's what they're trying to do. I think with tax receipts of 3 trillion, I think all government income combined comes up to something like 4 trillion per year. Yeah. And I've seen numbers. It's I think we just crossed to 31 trillion in total debt. It's like 30.9 or something. It's about to hit 31 trillion. I think most of the yields right now are at three and a half percent or so. Just it, and something like I saw Tavi Costa. He 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 put the number out there on Twitter that six or seven trillion in debt matures every year and has to be rolled over and refinanced. Mm -hmm. So something like okay, so six or seven trillion that used to be priced at below one percent interest rates now has to get refinanced by the U.S. Treasury at three and a half soon to be 4% interest wow. rates. Mm -hmm. It's quick to see. I think we paid $600 billion in interest on the debt last year. Mm -hmm. It's rapidly going to get above a $1 trillion, $1.2 trillion. I've seen some estimates that within two or three years, it's if, if they maintained interest rates at 4%, 
for two or three years, like they're talking about, and all of the national debt starts maturing and re- having to be refinanced at 4%. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's nuts. That's that's 1.2, 1.4, 1.5 trillion a year in interest. Yes. Plus new, plus new deficits being piled on top of that. that have, <laughs> they have to be financed at 4%. I mean, it's something like 40% of the government revenue is going to be going to service interest on the national debt. I mean, double what we spend on defense. It's yeah. crazy. I mean, they can't do it. They've got to lower rates. I'm yeah, just like we're, Japan. We're, Right, we're, we're we're getting right to the heart of the matter. These are inconvenient truths and uncomfortable truths, and th- there's a reason mainstream media doesn't talk about this stuff because it's it's uncomfortable, you know. <laughs> but you can ask the the a PhD economist these exact questions, and they don't have a solution that doesn't end really bad. There's wow. but there's only poor choices, and like you said, who's who's going to buy this debt? Who's going to refinance it? China's stepping back. China, uh, Saudi China, Arabia is stepping back. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm who's starting? I'm starting to interrupt. I'm passionate. No, about go for it. Yeah, I can <laughs> tell. I'm, I'm with you. The audience is going to be like, "Jim, stop interrupting your <laughs> Stop it. Get some help." I see those comments. I, I get it. I interrupt. <laughs> I told my editor to to move to remove my interruptions, but that's you know, hilarious. Yeah, but um, the issue here is it, this is not complex math. This is like yeah. third grade math. It is not complex. Anyone with half a half an ounce of common sense can figure this out. Mm-hmm. That this doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. Japan right now, they're they're at two hundred percent debt to GDP. Yeah. They can't increase interest rates. They're at a quarter percent, and they are having to buy their entire bond market. I mean, uh, the Japanese central bank literally owns fifty percent of all government debt in Japan, yeah. and they can't let they can't let interest rates increase because it would blow up the entire Japanese budget. That's that's wow. the crux of the matter right now is we're, we're at an inflection point where it's not just U.S. centric central planners around the world are going to have to choose. Do they default honestly and risk a deflationary depression or let in, sacrifice their currencies, let inflation run hot and give the mirage of economic growth? And they always choose the latter 100 percent of the time because people don't understand it, unfortunately, and they blame all the wrong people. They blame each other as opposed to the people who caused this mess in the first place because people don't understand inflation. So. You know, we may see yeah. deflationary impulses along the way. I'm certain we will, but I, I'm highly confident the overall trend in the years ahead is going to be inflationary. And, you know, silver and gold historically for millennia have been the prime beneficiary of this exact environment. Mm-hmm. I'm not advocating anyone go all in on silver and gold or anything like that, but hard commodities. I've been telling people yes. yep. it's hard yeah. to buy, buy physical assets that will have value in the next currency. Yep. Because, so, I mean, we're all of an age where we're all going to be around, I think, for the next 30 or 40 years. Mm-hmm. Ivan probably longer than me and Steve. <laughs> um, I know Ivan looks like he's 40 with his uh, <laughs> you know, premature balding, but Ivan's actually in his mid-20s. <laughs> you know that. But um, I, think, I think it's just inevitable at this point. I mean, how do you avoid something along the lines of the Great Depression or right. worse with all the macro, with the setup that we have in mac- the macro setup here? I just don't see a way out. And I hate to be so pessimistic. Yeah, and I don't, I don't pretend to know what they're going to do, but I, I am highly confident that they've got a plan in place, a new system. And the monetary international monetary system, I call it the rules of the game, global rules of the game. They change every 40 to 50 years. 1941, mm-hmm. we had the 1944 Bretton Woods Agreement. 1971, we took, came off the gold standards. That was you know, just over uh, 30 years. Well, we're this is long in the tooth. We're 50 years since the last restructuring of the global monetary system. So... You can go to IMF.org, and they're pretty candid there if you read their white papers because they know most people don't read it. You know, they're talking about things like an electronic SDR. We all know about central bank digital currencies. There's something uh-huh. coming bef- before this runs to its natural conclusion. They're going to try something else. And I don't think that'll work either. That'll eventually fail too. But You know, I hate to be the, a conspiracy theorist. But <laughs> this is Wall Street Silver, so that's where we usually end up going. But I saw this guy's tweet, and I had I, I, I retweeted it also. And it just seems so, like, I we've been through economic bad times, recessions before. But this is like the first time where I ever thought that our leaders were intentionally trying to destroy the economy. And I don't know how, many, how other people feel, but it just seems like you watch what the leaders of Europe are doing and our own leaders in the United States. And it just... You just sort of get the sense they're doing this intentionally, mm-hmm. that they're making all the bad decisions. It's like... If they weren't, 
if you wanted to ask yourself if they wanted to intentionally destroy the economy, would they be doing anything any differently than what they're doing right now? And right. I just don't think, I don't know. What, what's your opinion, Steve? Yeah, so I've been labeled a conspiracy theorist for a long time. Uh, I like to say, you know, I'm pretty grounded. I try and be objective and I don't go down, you know, deep. I've been down the rabbit holes, but I try and remain <laughs> pretty gr grounded. I'll, I'll put it that way. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's right out in the open now. It does seem pretty uh, undeniable that our leaders, quote unquote, are not working on our behalf. There's other objectives here. And, you know, I, I've been down full circle on this path. And for me personally, I've come to a place where this was, it can get depressing. But what, I, what I've learned to do over years, I mean, it was a long process for me, is to focus on the things I can control rather than trying to change the system, change the things I can control, and then try my best to, you know, enjoy life and live a life of purpose and meaning without focusing too much on it while acknowledging this stuff exists, do what I can, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I do, I have some food storage. That seems like a prudent step. I've got some water storage. I've got a backup Smart. solar generator. <laughs> yeah, things like that. Some, someone might say, hey, you're a conspiracy theorist or a prepper or whatever. Well, I... That seems like People a pretty. Insurance. It doesn't seem so crazy these days, does it? No, <laughs> no. We we have five. How many, people, it used to how many people have fire insurance and flood insurance and earthquake insurance? And those are good things to have, but those are far less likely to have. To, you're far less likely to need those <laughs> yeah, that's things right. than you know, a solar generator, and and it's cheap. It's a one time expense. So anyway, I, I th that's that's how I think about these things. Yeah, it, it's there's some uh, pretty dark things happening. Um, we don't have to go down the rabbit hole on it unless you want to but no, 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 yeah no, I, you, I don't I, I don't think you're crazy <laughs> so steve you know you're, you're known as the silver chartist uh what can you share with the audience for for the outlook right now what's the downside risk at this point versus the upside risk yeah uh glad you asked uh so whenever i look at a chart you know the first thing i look for is what's the trend and literally the trend in silver has just been straight sideways to down for two years now. That's no secret to anyone. And I look for, are there any clear patterns that give us um, you know, reliable patterns that could give you a clear indication of where the next move is likely to be? And I don't really see that, that in silver right now either. All you can say is we're deeply oversold. But from if you look at the historical metrics, the things that signify major bottoms, all of the pieces are in place. That does not mean like, hey, we're at a low right now. But I, I am highly, highly confident that we're very close Downside risk, maybe, I don't know, $3 or so, give or take. Mm -hmm. but if you're talking about upside potential of, you know, 50 plus silver, and I think much higher than that, let's just say 50, you know, you're talking about $30 of upside, 30 plus of upside for three or four downside. You know, it's a, like a 10 to one risk, re risk reward ratio. So well, and, and then a lot of the, a lot of the audience also participates in the gold and silver mining stocks. And, you know, while the, the underlying value of the silver is probably... Yes has a has a has a doubling potential yeah um the if the, you know people playing in the gold and silver mining stocks or the exploration stocks we're talking 5x 10x or even more for some of those yes. is likely yeah and that 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 might sound sensational but it's not at all um because if you look at ratios like i do this is other indications of a bottom i like to break this whole precious metals complex into six subcomponents physical gold physical silver senior gold miners senior silver miners junior silver miners junior gold miners and you run ratios against those internal components and historically at major lows it's the junior silver miners that are just obliterated they're just most undervalued on a relative basis mm -hmm. to, ever, to the other components and that's what we see right now so yeah yeah you could say they're riskier especially the explorers and developers but I mean, if you're looking for that 10 bagger plus potential, that that's where those opportunities are right now. It reminds me a lot of March of 